<laughs> and breathe. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to another Greater Westminster live stream. Hello. Yay. Yay. Uh, I'm Becky and... Constantine is here. Yes. In he my is. natural habitat. <laughs> That's right. You may notice that we're in a slightly different location to usual. Um, we don't have a fixed space in our rather small shop to stream from. And because there is no one else here today, we thought we would stream from here. So just us. Just, just us chickens. Um, <laughs> Obviously, someone has to still handle the mail orders and the click and collect delivery. So we have what's known as a skeleton crew. And that's what we are. Although I wish I was a little bit more skeletal. But anyway, <laughs> I would like to thank Terry and Roger and Joy for your contributions to the Coffee Fund already before we've even started. Thank, thank you, you very much. Very, very much. I would also like to acknowledge both Barra H and Mr. Ian Woolard for your contributions to the Coffee Fund via our PayPal link. So thank if you. you're ever not watching the stream live and you still want to contribute, you can do that using our PayPal link, which will be below. Um, now we're in, as I say, a slightly strange location. We also have internet issues so um <laughs> so bear with us if we suddenly disappear it's not because we don't love you it's because the internet dropped out but hopefully yeah. we'll manage to make it through this stream in one piece it's nice to stream via mobile phone yeah once in a while <laughs> literally using my phone to uh to stream off this so anyway who said that 5g was bad <laughs> now a very important point before we yes dive into this week's um stream I found out that 51% of you that watch this stream are not subscribed, <gasps> not subscribed to our channel. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, it takes about a second and a half to subscribe. So if you do like what you're watching and you're one of those 51% that are not subscribed, then please do click the subscribe button. It's beneath you, I think. It's on my Somewhere. screen over here. Yeah, it's over there. Exactly. So please do. We would love you to subscribe. Um, as we mentioned in our podcast earlier on this week, if you subscribe, then we know that you appreciate what we do. And it means that we can then do more of this stuff, which we, to be quite honest, we like doing it, don't That's we? That's true. We have fun. Um, despite the nerve wracking technical difficulties and all the rest of it, it's actually quite <laughs> enjoyable. Um, so that's it. Yeah, I know. Like sweating here with the, <laughs> with all the pressure. Um, so we've got subscribe. Yes. Coffee fund. Yes. Did that. What else do we need? PayPal me link. PayPal. Did I that we've one? done that. Okay. Vote for us. Oh I, yes, we I'm, are for good service award. Uh, yes, we're up for a good service award. Uh, the amateur photographer good service award, as I mentioned last week. We only have two weeks to make it to the top spot. Hopefully for that. So if you haven't voted for us, the link will be below. It is bit.ly, so a short and bitly link forward slash vote for GOW. If you can do that, we would massively appreciate it because we would really like to win. Uh, okay, I've done all that now. Fantastic. We can get onto the topic of the all right. stream. No, we have a giveaway as oh, well. Oh, no, we've got a giveaway. <laughs> Don't forget the giveaway. Okay, what are we giving away this week? Uh, we have this nice book, which is called Nikon A Celebration by Brian Long. It which, is really rather lovely, isn't it's it? It's very nice. It's no. a limited edition. Um, it celebrates Nikon. Yeah, and it's worth £40 pounds plus £40. PMP. Pounds. So if you would like to be in for a chance to win yeah. that, just put in the chat, and it has to be in the live chat. So if you're watching this later, sorry, you can't enter. Um, but pop in the live chat. I would like to win, and we will put your name in the bag to pull out at the end of the stream. Right. <laughs> now we can talk about the main topic. All right. What are we talking about today? Uh, today we're talking about AFD lenses, primes specifically. Okay. The news came out that all D lenses have been discontinued. And we found this information on Nikon Japan website. Yes. While they're not discontinued in the UK and North America yet, it seems like the things will come eventually. I think the reason for that one of the reasons that a couple of people emailed me this week, which was very valid. Yeah. Are they made in Japan? They're made in Japan. We no longer have a Japanese manufacturing That's right. factory. So the AFD lenses and the AIS lenses, we'll do another stream on that another time. And obviously they require their own pipeline to be built. And I guess it's just uh, doesn't make sense for them to do it in other countries because yeah. it's extra investments and they probably can concentrate on more more than equipment. Yeah, exactly. So um, it, it does makes sense but it is kind of the end of an era that's true and we thought we would talk about it a little bit we also um had the lovely simon stafford chip in some of his recommendations for afd lenses but we're going to just take you through the timeline 
Cast your mind back, people. Let me take you on a journey. Do you need that kind of like historical <laughs> flashback music? Um, to 1983. It should be like to 70 on this disco play. Yeah, you know, but... <laughs> but instead it's the 1983. So it's going to be like electro pop. Yeah. <laughs> when the Nikon F3 AF came out. Uh, the Nikon F3 AF was Nikon's first offering. On, That's true. On the autofocus side of things, wasn't it? Yes, they released only two lenses, 18mm mm -hmm. 2.8 lens and 200mm f3.5. Which has never been replicated in a focal length since. That's true, and they don't really work with any other cameras. No. <laughs> so, so those were slightly odd ones, but they were Nikon's first kind of offering. And yeah. then we call them prototypes in a way. Yes, a little so bit. So they Although tested they, the waters. They tested the waters with those. I will say um, that the... Sorry, I lost my chain of thought because I was reading a comment from David who said, could you please stop saying all the nice places you're from? Because <laughs> he lives in a rubbish place with no mountains. That's that's horrible. Anyway, um, the 80 mil and the 200 f3.5, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they also brought out with it a TC16. And they yes. did two versions, a TC16 dedicated for the f3. So manual focus lenses. For manual focus lenses, yeah. for the f3 AF. Yes. And then they did a TC16A, which was for everything else, as far as I know. Yes. And that would allow autofocus yeah. on autofocus lenses. No, manual focus lenses. Manual focus lenses. Manual focus lenses could then become autofocus. Okay. Mind blown? Is so your mind blown? It, 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 <laughs> had, it had a built-in motor inside the... Essentially, yeah. So okay, it would so FTZ run. Mark II is coming out eventually. <laughs> That's my prediction. They've done it before. It's going to happen again. Mark my words. Yeah, so it does, you know, the technology has been there before. I've mentioned a couple of times that the, um, what is it? The TC16A doesn't work, doesn't autofocus with modern digital cameras mm -hmm. with manual focus lenses. Uh -huh. I've seen, um, in fact, if uh, Woody is on here, he'll, he'll know. We did a whole discussion one time when he was mm -hmm. in the shop um, about how you could actually do something, and I can't remember what it was, but somehow mechanically change the internal workings of the TC16A so that it mm -hmm. would fit digital cameras. And it, it would be a hammer and screwdriver. It was like a hammer and screwdriver jobby, okay. um, and obviously I personally never attempted it. What's a bottle of whiskey <laughs> to grease the wheels, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a bit of courage, really, to, to try that. So the TC16A was a slightly odd one, but it was Nikon's transition from manual focus to, to autofocus and you know, so, steering things in that direction. So say. for FTZ Mark II, yeah. all they have to do is dig out the old design documents for TC16A yeah. and just reuse them. Nikon, if you're watching, there's a tip for you. I'll call my uncle again. <laughs> Um, Roy says he still has those F3 AF lenses, so there you go. We will also open up the floor. I'm trying to read the comments um, while I go along, but there's just so many. Um, but I will definitely... It, do, please do do like while you're going along if you like what we're doing please do hit the little thumbs up there um but i will try and read the comments as i go along there's a lot of people who would like to win the book so I got, oh that's nice so i'm trying to read in between those so people like read yeah. yeah see chan says i wish nikon would make an ft uh, generation 2 ftz adapter yeah that's exactly what we were just talking about um yeah i think that's it roy the tc16a pins need to be moved it's a it's an awkward thing well, is it a soldier job I don't remember. There's a there's a couple of forums which have kind of the guidelines and blueprints for what you need to do. Mm. But it was something that I didn't want to attempt myself. I think we should do a video on that. <laughs> yeah, How we tried and we failed. Yeah, challenge accepted. Yes. Uh, by con. I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, so that was that was 1983. Yes. And then in 1986, okay. we had the F501. Okay. Also known as the N202 to uh, our US and Canadian uh, watches. This camera came out in 1986 and that was the first native autofocus camera. Mm -hmm. So in digital equivalent, yeah. what camera would it be? In Would it be entry level or semi-professional or professional camera? But to be honest, it was a... It was a Sort of, I would say, keen amateur middle mm -hmm. of the road it would be our equivalent of a D7500. D7500, okay. That, that kind of, because then later on, because they had the F301, mm -hmm. which was the manual focus little brother. And to... that would be D3000, basically. Yeah, it was like okay. the D3000 to the F3. Yeah. And it's it's true because D3000 also doesn't work with autofocus <laughs> AFD lenses. It's funny. Yeah, only FX. <laughs> That's right. But the F301. 
um, was a was a little brother to the F three. Mm-hmm. The F five hundred one was like next. I can see that the little brother of F five. It's something like <laughs> no, well, no, no, the F five was much came later. Came out earlier, yeah. Um, but the F, uh, it's interesting that the the three and the five remain consistent. Mm-hmm. But would we call it the kind of the first sort of Fox Nikon camera that would use kind of well not we more know. than generation but let's say if Just, you call f3 prototype yeah so so that would be the first camera that would use the standard af lenses yeah. that are screw driven exactly okay. so these these sort of things um i just put my hand yeah. on the front element of the 14 <laughs> and you can't there. see them i can't see them so <laughs> i'm gonna have to clean them uh, but what we were talking about in our previous streams remember when we were talking about little d's and medium ones yeah where they implemented the new technology mm. in the entry-level cameras first yeah and then they moved on to professional cameras. So it seems like it's a similar pattern in this case. Yeah. Because if F4 came out later. It did. It came out two yeah. years later, in fact. So they waited a whole two years to bring out a pro body with autofocus. That's so interesting. But, and two years is quite a long time in In current digital terms. age, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So um, this is interesting. Stephen says that he has the 80 mil for the F3 AF. Doesn't have an F three AF, but the lens also works in autofocus on the F five hundred one. This is something that we did because we didn't have the lenses. We did have an entire F three AF outfit um, with about both lenses, with both yeah. lenses about nine months ago, and um, of course they were in mint condition. I didn't sort of use them or anything, no. so I wasn't sure if they would work with other cameras. But there you go. So it does work with the F five hundred one, which is great. Someone snapped a bargain. Totally, and the, and an eighty two point eight is a really interesting focal length. I think. So, um, figgies.com says, I use the TC16 AF, A, 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 but AF, with D2X and manual focus 300 2.8. Mm-hmm. So, does it autofocus? That's my question to you, because that was obviously the big selling point of the TC16A. Um, if it does, then that's very cool. Um, mm-hmm. I'm amazed at how many people also had the F501. It was a camera that I didn't really see. It wasn't much on my radar. I mean, because it came out before I was born. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like even later, a lot of cameras came out before I was born. Yeah, still young. <laughs> Believe spirit. it or not. Um, but 1986, 1988, the F4 came out in 1988. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So really, that should be... But it's interesting. You mentioned F301 was actually their first DSLR that uh, featured automatic film advance. SLR. Yes. It wasn't DSLR. Well, SLR, yes. It's <laughs> DSLR. It's everything DSLR now. Yeah. <laughs> it just rolls um, off the tongue. But that, that's interesting as well. And then F501 was the second camera to feature that. So automatic film advance. There you go. So there were definitely some interesting features that they put into these sort of more mass market models rather than putting them in the pro bodies first. But, you know, we don't hear about those cameras. No, we don't. It seems like when we talk about film cameras, we always talk about flagships. So F5, F3, F4, but not something like F301 or even F80. Yeah, we don't. But we also don't see many of those come through. And I I wonder if that's partly because people mostly hang on to them Mm. or whether they kind of reached a point. They they weren't the same kind of timeless design that you have with the FMs and the FM2s and the FEs. Well, they they look like really old, you know, like a double deck kind of tape players. They do a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And Figgy says, yes, it does, Becky, and without any modification to the TC16A. So there you go. You... You can use the TC16A on the D2X. I know someone had to modify it to put it on their D750, and I'm not sure why that was. But anyway, this is, this is very interesting. Um, so F501, 1986, F4, 1988, and we started to see these AF lenses that we know is the first version of AF. Mm-hmm. Now, I will, if I can do this without um, making it all go horribly wrong, look at that. So that is the design of the first version of AF lenses. Now you'll see that the focusing ring is plastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and although it's very, very hard to see on this picture, instead of a switch to change your, um, to lock your aperture, mm-hmm. you have this little push and twist button. It's which, like a screw almost. Yeah, it's really awkward. Yeah. <laughs> so so that was the first generation. Those came out in, um, 90, sorry, between 1986 and 1991. Mm-hmm. So they ran yeah. for about five years like this. So it's got very similar um, aperture ring, but mm-hmm. they removed the rabbit ears. That's so, right. So uh, yeah. they've done that. They put the lock. That's right. Between manual focus. And obviously and because it's also focused and it's driven by uh, the coupling fork in the camera, yeah. uh, the focusing ring, well, for manual focus, it doesn't look as good as manual focus lens. No, it doesn't really feel as nice no, either. It feels really loose in a way, yeah. It and I nice. personally have found with those lenses that you get that kind of, when they autofocus, 
they make a really loud noise. That's true. Like, <laughs> yes, yes, it's been really the first new. generation of lenses, absolutely. Yeah, you can definitely hear it. So then, after, so 1991, mm -hmm. we saw what was called, once it loads, there we go, the N version or the new version. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the difference between the AF and the AF new version mm -hmm. was purely cosmetic again. So you see with, we've got that lovely... They've changed the focusing ring. Yeah, you've got that rubber focusing ring. And it feels a lot nicer. It feels a lot nicer. It feels a lot more like these ones that we have now. Yes, the, the D-types. Cosmetically. Pretty much identical. Um, and instead of that awkward push button that I was complaining about, you mm. get that switch yes. on the aperture. And you need that switch because if you use it on the cameras that have a uh, front and back command dial or main command or sub command dials, you, you no longer need to change your, uh, to turn the aperture in to change the aperture. That's right. So you can now do it via the controls of the camera. And to do that, you have to lock your lens to the smallest F number, so F16 or F30 or F32. Or 22, whatever um, it is, yeah. So smallest aperture, that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, so, oh, highest F number. Um, and then that will allow you to control the camera camera via controls on the body, basically. So, yeah. yeah. So if you do have any of these older D lenses or non-D lenses, the earlier versions, and you put them on a modern day camera or any film camera that controls the aperture through mm -hmm. the body, be sure to just lock that aperture ring. Um, it's impossible for me to show you. I'm actually quite far away from the camera. You see those orange numbers there? No, you can't. Well, you can almost see those orange numbers there. Um, that's where you need to lock the aperture. That's why it has a lock switch on it for you to do that. Um, but the beauty of that yeah. is if you've got something like Nikon FM, FA or FE, you can still use it as a manual focus lens and then change the aperture by uh, aperturing. Yeah, exactly. So if you've got a DSLR and a film body, it's great. DSLR and DSLR. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. If you've got... A Z camera, unfortunately, it's not so useful. Yeah, it gives you dash dash, it doesn't re give you the aperture. Rings, no, that's right. Yeah. So, um, so that's an unfortunate thing. This is why we want the FTZ Mark II. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that if you do have one of the sort of, I'd say, slightly higher end digital bodies, so I think certainly D300, D200, D500 mm -hmm. on up, you can set in the custom settings menu to control the aperture, by, control the aperture the ring. by the aperture ring. That's true. So if you prefer to use the aperture ring over using the front dial, whenever you put a D lens on, the camera will recognize it and it will allow you to control the aperture using that ring. Yeah. Um, if you're switching from film to digital, it's quite a useful thing to have because right. then you don't need to learn a lot more you know, new things yeah. at the same time. Exactly. It's under custom settings menu, F controls, and then it's... Um, Customize command dials and mm -hmm. then it's aperture setting. Anyway, it's just for anyone who, Here we go, yeah. who cares. And I also like the redesigned focusing ring because A, yeah, it's my, it feels a lot nicer uh, to use. For sure. But also they're a little bit less noisy compared to the first generation. I mean, they're still noisy, yeah. but definitely quieter than the generation one. Absolutely. And then we went to the... So those weren't produced. The D versions were produced between sort of 94 and 90... Sorry, I beg your pardon. The, the new versions. Mm -hmm. Good Lord. <laughs> so think about like, they had like iPad and then new iPad. That's right. Nikon was there first. <laughs> Nikon. Nikon was there first with it. So we had the lens, the AF lens, and then we had AF new lens. Yes. Those came out in 1991. And then again, four, three years later, yeah. 94. 95. They released the D lenses. They released D, D stands lenses. for digital. I'm kidding. No, it doesn't. It stands for distance. Digital didn't exist back then. Yeah, so distance information chip. So if you have a look at what we've got up on the screen here, there you go. You can see cosmetically, it looks quite, it's the same. It, cosmetically, it's the same as the other one, but the big clue here is that there's a D after the aperture. Now, do you want to explain what that means or shall I? Okay, D stands for distance. And information that chip. information chip, <laughs> yeah. here we go, and that basically allows you to use your lens with the flash and flash will know exact distance between the camera and the subject so that it can calculate the light exposure, so how much light it will produce exactly. according to that information, so it's a little bit more precise. Yeah, so it provides TTL information to the flash when you're using one of these D lenses, it tells the flash, look, the subject is three meters away or whatever, yeah. or five two feet away yeah and at the time they called it DT dttl yeah. effectively and then they switched to ittl later on yeah exactly so that's the honestly the only difference i haven't seen um and i have looked through long long spec sheets i haven't seen an example where they also changed any optical designs no, no. they all seem to be 
the same in terms of number of elements, number of groups, um, maximum aperture, minimum aperture, all of that is the same. So um, it's really just down to, if you're not using flash, there is absolutely no harm in buying a non-D lens. If you are using flash, then obviously the D would be better, particularly if you're planning to shoot TTL. So there's a little point of interest for you. Okay, but tell me the difference. So what's the difference between, let's say, standard AF lens or D lens mm -hmm. um, compared to AFSG type lens? So okay. is that the, the way they ought to focus or what's happening there? Yeah, so there's two, there's two elements to it. Yes. Actually, there's three. So I know what it is, but... You, you just know. want to ask me for me on the top. No, okay, so the first point is that you've got the AFS motor, so sign wave motor, later. thank you. <laughs> Constructive criticism only, please. Uh, so you've got the silent wave motor, which yep. means that they don't make that lovely whirring sound when you focus, they're supposed to be silent. Um, you've lost the aperture ring, so therefore can't use the lenses on your older film bodies that need the manual mm -hmm. aperture. And in most cases, the optical design was different, so you'd have different coatings, different numbers, of elements in different yeah. groups completely redesigned cosmetically entirely different mm -hmm. um now so i just want to read the comments for a second we, we don't sell focusing screens for the d610 unfortunately it's not a nikon product I yeah according to nikon does. they're not replaceable uh they're third party companies that make them it may affect your metering as well so do it at your own risk or contact repair company who can do it for you there you go i think the company that used to do them back in the day was cuts eye uh, K A T Z. Yeah, but they, um, they're and, gone now. Yeah, they've gone now. So just look around. If, um, yeah, yeah, I believe you can put split screen image on those, but again, at your own risk. Effectively, you will be voiding warranty by doing this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now look, it's interesting. Um, Figgies.com says you have to relocate the pin for the TC16A on later DSLR bodies. Um, mm. i.e. the D3 and the D300. It does involve a hand drill and soldering, but works with manual focus lenses on digital bodies. So Interesting, we're getting there. We're getting, getting there, to the bottom so of it. surely. Um, and Roy made it some some good points there. So please do read the comments if you're interested in, in doing that. Um, Nabaroon says uh, he uses an F401. Wow, an F401. That's an autofocus body. That was okay. the upgrade to the F301. Interesting. And you know those little 35 to 70... Um, kit lenses. Yes. Oh, AF, yes. F three point three to yeah, four point five. Those yeah. are the lenses that that it came with. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Now, room. That's great. Um, and then we have. Oh, I've just got a whole bunch of new comments. Goodness me. Okay, Nikon F four or one in North America known as N four double oh four. Why did they do that? <laughs> they had yeah, they, they're the same as F eighty and eighty as well. Yeah, N eighty. But I know, but F five oh one translating to N two oh two. That's true. It doesn't ha it doesn't follow any logical sequence as far as I'm concerned. There's probably a reason. Yeah, I'm glad they fixed it though. Yeah, I'm glad that they made it slightly easier um for us to understand. We're gonna talk about our favorite AF lenses shortly and a lot of you are actually just putting your favorites in there. I will try and read back some of the comments. We're talking about primes. We won't do zooms just yet because um, yeah, there's I'm... plenty to cover. <laughs> we can stay here for hours On then. the primes alone. So now we know the differences between all of them. Yes. Um, so starting with the wider end, mm -hmm. you know, the most kind of common of the modern generation that has just been discontinued uh, is the 14, actually. 14 millimeter f 2.8. which I just put my hand on a second to go. The one you put your finger all over. I put my over. finger in it, so I will definitely have to clean that. So the 14 2.8 has that similar design mm -hmm. as a courier. <laughs> this is the problem with doing it on the shop floor and us only being here. So the 14 2.8 has that similar design to the 14 to 24, for those of you that yep. can see that. Can you can't put filters on it. Can't put filters on it. And to be honest, um, do you remember Tony, of course you remember Tony, yes. he used to work here. He used to say that the 1424 was as sharp as the 14mm prime. He was actually saying it's sharper, according yeah. to the Nikon engineer. Yeah. So, yeah. That was that was the inside skinny from him. Yeah. So, it has that old sort of push the button, twist the lock um, for manual to autofocus. I was never a fan of those mm, because, because they yeah. crack. Yeah, if you crack it, it's an expensive repair, unfortunately. It's and about it's... 80, 90 pounds at least. Uh, and nowadays they don't have the parts anymore. Which is very frustrating. Yeah. So um, so you have to be a little bit gentle with these. Um, but in terms of a wide angle prime, I mean, 14 is is fantastic yeah. for interior. That used to be the widest lens. Yeah, exactly. Nikon. So, so the 14, and I think... I can't actually see if we've still got one in stock, but we did have them in. Have we got a 14 mil in that cupboard? Can you see from where you are on the shelf? No. What's the widest? Bottom we've shelf? got 20. 
I think 20 is the widest one. Yeah, yeah. okay, fair enough. We were getting them new because I ordered some for someone. Anyway. Yeah, and they're almost as expensive as 1424 2.8G. Exactly. So I would say, you know, at this point, it makes sense to get a 1424 unless yeah. you need the aperture ring. Because um, obviously there isn't anything really this wide in manual focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, True. this is not going to be a talk about manual focus lenses. As I say, we are going to do something separately on that. But in terms of wide angle manual focus lenses, um, you had the 18, mm. then you had fish eyes, pretty much. And then yes. obviously you had the super uber rare well, 13 they, they had mil. like 15, 3, 5. Yeah, fish eyes and rectilinear, yeah. a few mm -hmm. wide angles. But the 14 was kind of the last of it. It had ED glass as well. So a very nice lens. Um, and then... They went up to, I've got the 16 mil fisheye. Well, 16 fisheye, that came with the actual, the filters, set of filters mm -hmm. for black and white photography. And it has to have a clear filter on the rear as well. It's considered part of the optical construction. So if you have or get one of these, make sure it's got the filter attached to the rear of it, even if you don't use the black and white filters. This is a lovely lens. It's not very sharp. <laughs> In my opinion, I've used all the variants of it, even the old 16 3.5 manual focus. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think as a fisheye lens, it doesn't have to be sharp. Exactly, you know I mean? exactly. And depth of field is huge at that, even wide open. It focuses really, really close as well. It does. And then 10.5 DX fisheye lens is effectively based on the same design. Exactly. 25 centimeters it focuses. You can That's pretty close. probably even get closer yet. Um, I had, oh, but I don't have them with this. Oh, I didn't download them. Done. I mm. have some pictures with the 16 mil, actually, that I didn't get ready for this presentation. I think the widest that I started with is like 24 mil. Well, next time. Next please. time. <laughs> Damn. Um, I completely forgot about that. Anyway, so the 16 and then the 20. Yes. I don't have a 20 to hand, but we do have some in stock. So we have them brand new still. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, yeah, no one buys a fisheye to be sharp. That's not the purpose of this. Exactly. It's a fun little lens. It I is. call it special effects lens in a way. It is. And I, I always enjoy using fisheyes, even if yeah. they're very kind of um, quite niche. Mm -hmm. um, so the 20 mil 2.8, I would say I had one for a while. I upgraded to the 21.8 mm -hmm. because honestly, it was a million times better. Mm -hmm. Um, but the AF lenses, most of them had a similar similar optical design to yeah. the manual focus equivalent. So if you liked the manual focus lens, you wouldn't then lose anything by going to the autofocus lens. Um, the 20, Jan says, the 20 was a staple in my Aquatica underwater housings with F3 and later F4. Superb lens. There you go. That's someone who has the... Um, Aaron says, Aaron says, what's your view of the 20 AFD? Um, that's another courier. Sorry. <laughs> so distracting. What's your view of the 20 AFD? So he found it terrible on his D800. It is. And that's the point where uh, all D lenses are not very good on cameras with resolution higher than 24 megapixels. Yeah. That um, is what I have found personally as well. And that's where when I bought my D800E, that's where I had to let my D lenses go, Sell all of them, everything. and upgrade to G. Yeah. But if you're on 24 megapixel body, like Z6, D780, D750, they're still fantastic. No, they're okay. Well, I, they're wouldn't okay. Say, I wouldn't say they're fantastic, I mean, the, but they're good. In, in my opinion, the reason why I love this lens, and we started with 20 and up to about 50 mil lens, the beauty of them that they're tiny yes. compared to their G equivalents or even Z equivalents. Yeah. And if you're looking at this kind of street live documentary run and gun setup, they're amazing for what they are. So I consider them in a way, um, they, they're almost like pancakes. Yeah. If you compare to them to G lenses or Z lenses, they're tiny. And the reason they're fantastic is for, for this specific reason. Then they won't produce the best image quality currently compared to the modern lenses, but they're, they're pocketable. You can yeah. have one, you know, couple of primes in your pockets and one on the body easily can switch from let's say 20 to 50 and then you know so have something else as an example of that i shot an entire wedding with the 24 mil afd mm -hmm. 2.8 and the 85 1.8 here we go um obviously there was another shooter that was shooting with zooms mm -hmm. either 24 70 the 7200 but for all those lovely kind of isolated shots and detail shots and portraits and things like that there, there was a nice combination yep. actually worked really really well um the uh, Nick says the 8 to 15 fisheye is very sharp. I was going to qualify the, the fisheye yeah. statement with that one, actually. You're quite right. If you buy a fisheye now, definitely get 8 to 15. Yeah, if you uh, particularly because it's 
the most flexible fisheye yeah. of all of them and it produces so many different images um that's right and it's type. only autofocus fisheye from nikon that has circular effect that's right yeah, yeah. and it's happens like to be sharp focus, but yeah <laughs> yeah so love a good fisheye yeah um sam just to reiterate on the 16 mil make sure you've got a filter in the back of it because you need it as part of the yeah. optical if, design of the if lens. you're sourcing them off places like ebay mm. do make sure that they will have at least clear filter at the back yes you, you don't really need the color filters. They're mainly for black and white photography, but there has That's to be a filter cool. at the back yeah. in order for lens to work on the body. Exactly. It doesn't autofocus properly otherwise. So there we go. So that was the 20, 24. Yes, 24, and then 28 f2.8 is uh, one of my favorite lenses when I started was uh, it? my photography. When I bought my f100. It was the 28, was the go Yes, too. back in New York, <laughs> I got 28 f2 and uh, 2.8 and uh, 51.8 D lenses. And I was in my documentary phase. <laughs> So so we all have phases pictures. in our life. So. We do, we do, we do. <laughs> and at the time, I wanted to do documentary photography or be a photojournalist, and I loved uh, shooting black and white. Uh, so I was on the streets of New York doing some street life photography, photographing protests and things like this. And 28 to 8 is fantastic for this. This, yeah. it, this gives you this beautiful kind of documentary view, you know. Um, for sure. And then 50 gives you a really nice shallow depth of field at 1.8. And it's funny, I very much played around and bounced between the 28 and the 35 mm -hmm. as vocal lengths. And now I'm a 35 shooter, but I had the 28 for a long, long time. I've evolved now to 35. You've evolved. Because <laughs> I, I do more portraiture nowadays, and 35 is beautiful for environmental portraiture. Yes. Just because you don't get as much distortion. Mm. It's still wide, but it's not as wide as 28. Uh, but uh, at the time... 28 mil gives you this beautiful documentary look. You yes. Know, this, uh, what's this agency? Getty? No, not the Getty. Um, <laughs> which? The one which has a lot of Leica shooters. I'm sure people would point out. Well, someone has a lot of like. well, there's a 30 second lag. So there we go. Oh, Magnum. Oh, you know, okay. This Magnum look. You know. <laughs> That's right. You yeah. do get that. It's yeah. very true with that one. Um, of the 211 people that are watching, and thank you for watching, um, please do hit the thumbs up button while we're here because I can see from your screen that there are 70 likes. 70 likes. So maybe the other 130 don't like us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. If you don't like us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so that was the... Now, I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah. The 20 had an AF and then a D version, but it didn't have that interim. No. Whereas the 24 and the 28... They had the end. Both had yeah. the new version mm -hmm. in between the two. I've got some examples from those two lenses, from you 28 do? and 50. Okay. Um, are they in the folder? They are in the folder. Which one? Oh, you've well, named them? Uh, yes. So okay. if you go to black and white ones, so that was Let me just... some protest in New York. Smooth. Okay. So this was... Okay. Okay. Wow. That was a time. So I think it was 2004. And yeah. George W. Bush was going for the second term. I'm trying to just move it up a bit. So what they the did is, New York, which is a democratic city in North America, it's probably the most democratic city. So they decided to do a Republican convention in there. Um, so obviously people went on the streets and I was there in the right moment. So I just got my camera for the first week and I just went there and I was photographing all sorts of different things there. And this is with the 28. That's 28 and F2. Is there another one with 28? Uh, yes. This one is 28 F2, wow. uh, 2.8, yeah. Um, and then the next one would be 51.8. No, nope. oh, no, that's, that's not my 51.8 no. shot. That uh, shot which I called Gandhi. Yet. Oh, Gandhi. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you called it? That's why I can't find it. Yeah, here it is. Uh, oh, one. there we go. And then this is the 51.8. And that's 51.8. Right. Oh, that's a great shot though. So that's so I also had a fifty and I tend a uh, fifty one point eight D, but I used that on my D two hundred and my D three hundred. Mm -hmm. So that shot of the little tree frog was shot mm -hmm. on the D, I think D two hundred mm -hmm. with the fifty one point eight. It was the the problem with um both of those cameras, but mm -hmm. primarily the D two hundred was that it was so poor in high ISOs mm -hmm. that having the fifty one point eight, even though it was really a seventy five mil, mm -hmm. just allowed me to to open up. <laughs> <laughs> the aperture really wide. And this one was on F100. This one was like, yeah, so this is... So you did shoot film. Of course I did. Back in the know. day. <laughs> um, I'm just going to have, before I dive into the 50s, because we haven't given enough love to the 35s yet, but we should. John yes. says, I used to like the 28 and 35, gave all my kit away in 2000, didn't have a camera for 10 years. Mm. That was very generous of you, John. Um, Albert has... Uh, probably in mention to an earlier comment, but I haven't seen it. The AFD 28mm f2.8. 
Um, Navarin asks, how would the 22.8 do with the D780 for astrophotography very specifically? Mm, I would go for 1.8 equivalents. Uh, you want to get as wide as aperture as you possibly can. Now, also keep in mind, all the D lenses, wide open, on very high resolution bodies, you get a lot of chromatic aberrations. And they normally uh, will result in either purple or blue fringing. Yeah. Now, the problem with that is, because it's so extreme, it's quite difficult to correct it in the post-processing, like in play, um, raw converters like Lightroom or yeah. Capture One. Uh, so you really have to stop the lenses down to at least a four, so one stop, uh, to get there. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of that. That's the problem of these D lenses now in digital bodies. For you sure. wouldn't have that on film. Now, if it helps, Nabarun, I did do with um, with the very kind help of Steve Neal, who is a regular uh, viewer and contributor to the stream. We did an astrophotography like how to get started back in like peak lockdown when I was doing them from home. Well, yeah, and do check it out. The, and the lens that I used was the 21.8 G. Uh, I would definitely recommend that above and beyond anything else for astrophotography if you do want those kind of wide shots. Um, also, one thing that I noticed with the AF lenses, and this was the reason why I ended up upgrading all mine, because you know me, I stuck with 24 megapixels for a very long time. Yes, you I, did. I held out as long as I could. I was um, trying. I was trying really hard. <laughs> but the reason that I changed was because the, it just the wasn't lenses, good enough let's be honest no, it was because the afd lenses produce such noise they mm -hmm. just kind of fall apart when you shoot at high isos mm -hmm. so on the d700 on the d750 even when i was shooting above let's say a thousand mm -hmm. or around 800 to a thousand mm -hmm. the lenses could no longer keep up with the demands of the camera that's true so um for noise if particularly for shooting low light like astrophotography um noise reduction can sometimes eliminate stars when yes. you're doing post-processing and that would be problematic so i wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that but you know the interesting thing about this lens as well that in some cases the D lens well even actually in most cases the D lenses focus faster yeah. than prime AFS lenses not all the time the 51.4 does though yeah <laughs> for that's sure. the, thing. Um, the problem with this obviously they're noisy and again on high resolution bodies if uh, because it's not what's focus is not as precise as would be with the AFS lens yeah so if it's slightly autofocus you will notice it yes exactly yeah. Um, I'd like to thank Gary for contributing to the Coffee Fund because I missed that one off. If anyone else would like to contribute to the Coffee Fund, as it's just us here today, we would greatly appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so um, so that was the that super chat. This button, it's next to your head. It's up there somewhere. You haven't. It's actually you can't see it. It's a little dollar see. sign. It's by. It's quite handy Dalla. having it going as a dollar sign. Um, so we got the thirty five f two was the next yes. one. Um, that is a lens that has quite a lot of love I yeah think. i think when when you're looking for this type of lenses you really have two options yeah it's 28 or 35 yeah and everyone decides depending on their preferences isn't it yes exactly um jay vladcliffe says i'm looking to get the 35 f2 for my d700 that's a nice combination yeah. particularly if you are doing kind of documentary reportage style stuff all d lenses are great on d700 yeah exactly and uh james who was on here commenting earlier about his 35 and 50 one four also uses the 35 um, and is doing a one lens project which i'm following closely on instagram uh so the 35 f2 as you're kind of like one lens for a whole month mm -hmm. i think that's quite a nice challenge that's what i do normally with the 35 one four to be fair so it's like for me that wouldn't be unusual yeah. um i'm using the 50 which I don't usually use. I don't like 50 mil as a focal length. I'm oh, not doing any change at the moment. I know. Well, you missed my stream last week. That's why. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, you didn't You didn't decide to take up the challenge. You were yeah. there in spirit. Well, but... going to the gym was my main <laughs> New Year resolution. <laughs> but let's, be honest, let's be honest. Let's be honest. That's not happening. Yeah. Um, we cannot forget... <laughs> We cannot forget the 28 1.4 AFD, which was a special and is a slightly unusual lens because they didn't make that many of them. No. Even even Simon Stafford, who has given me a list of his kind of all time favorites of the AFD lenses, um, mentioned the legendary 28 1.4 and a couple of people have also mentioned it in the chat. Um, I never got to use one of those, but I was absolutely delighted when Nikon brought out the 1.4 E. Oh, yes. AFS lens. This is a beautiful lens. That's the best 28 yeah. 1.4 lens. Well, just tw full stop 28, 28 mil. mil. Yeah. It is the best 28 mil around. Um, thank you so much to RSD. 
Dunn, is that right? RS Dunphy, Dunphy, photography. Dunphy com, right. photography. I com. Thank you very much. Ruined that, um, reading that off. And thank you very much to Brian as well. Thank you, Brian. Both of you for your contribution for the coffee fund. Very much appreciated. Coffee and cakes all round, I think. Um, yeah, not going to help me with my gym resolution. But <laughs> no, it's that's like fine. you said you were hungry. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, let's feed him. <laughs> um, so the 28.1.4 D version. Yeah. I see once, about once a year. I, I think we've seen yeah. over 10 oh, years I'm here. 12 I've lost years. The counts, 12 or 13. We've been here for 12 years. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so we saw about three. I think we've sold about three. They all went to collectors. Yeah. Beautiful lenses. Really lovely. Um, but nowadays, just get 28 one for you. Yeah, if you can, I would say, and if it works, obviously if you're trying to use it amongst film bodies and DSLRs, then great, yeah. go for the D version. But if you don't need it for that, then then the 1.4E is yeah, just... Yeah, it's definitely physically smaller. Yeah. Um, it's about the size, it's even smaller than the 85 1.4D. But it, not by much. Not by much. No. So, but still, compared to something like 28 1.4E, yes. it's half the size. <laughs> this is true. Exactly. So that was the 28, we talked briefly about the 35s. The 35 F2 was the only... They didn't do a 2.8 or anything. They no, just they did didn't do one four as well. No, exactly. No. So then we jumped to the good old nifty 50. Oh, yes. 51 AD was one my one of my first Nikon lenses. Mine too. And so that was my kind of starter lens on the D200, which of course was a 75mm. Yeah. I remember um, I had one in New York and mm. I don't know what happened to it, but then I bought <laughs> another one on my first year working here yeah. and I paid £75 for a brand new. Wow, they've really gone up in price. That's true. <laughs> Though not by much. They went up to about 120, something like that. Yeah, they were about 119 kind of yeah, pounds. They around that price. And I think we may have one left in the cupboard. Ooh, um, we do have 35 F2s left brand new. Um, I actually get an order about once every couple of months from a an electronics company that usually clean us out of those. Yeah, didn't we sell like 10 of them in one go? Yeah, yeah. They, they usually order like a whole batch. I think they use them for their equipment, testing equipment. Oh, uh, okay. Um, Interesting. So, but once those are gone as far as we know they're they're gone so um see it's diff funny different people have different opinions about whether 28 or 35 is better yeah um but very if you, personal it is very personal but if you are looking for a 35 i can see from across the room a few and a couple of 51.8s i would have both you would yeah well of course <laughs> no 35 is great for internal as i say uh, uh environmental portraiture yeah it's amazing yeah but for outdoor street live this kind of documentary style which is 28 is beautiful and i don't it's funny how many people like the 50 for that sort of thing you mm. know as a go-to lens i don't use the 50 for i do that. find it a bit more like a too narrow yeah in a way yeah. absolutely and uh so as i say i started off with the 50 on my um, D200, D300, I was going to see if I could pull up the 50 mil. You've got quite a few 50 shots here. Yeah, the standing, the, the red one is um, 518. And that is 518 as well, still okay. your work. Let's just share them from, I'm going to do them in sequence. So here we go. So this was a 518, this was a studio shot. Um, He's I... a bit angry, I don't know why, but... <laughs> angry, yeah, but it's very sharp, look at yeah. that. So that was just with the good old... I'm just going to keep zooming in. <laughs> Let's try and zoom out now. <laughs> zoom out. Go on, you can do it. There we go. So that was the 518 in the studio. That was yeah. also a studio shot. That's all studio shot. Um, I had quite limited space in the studio, so I did all the full height shots at on 50, and then I shot basically the rest on 85. That's quite impressive. I mean, it's not that bad in terms of space. If you I was literally back to the wall <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Like, could you just step a little closer to the backdrop, yeah. please? Um, and then this one you mentioned was also with your that's, 50. That's 50 as well, yeah. And then, just sorry, because no, I have... 28. And these are yeah. 28. 28, 28. This is my uh, tree frog shot on the 50th. This was a D200, so this was trying to get as much light as possible. Is it in England? It is, actually. It's in Yellow London. Yellow frogs? London. In London? No, it's in London Zoo. Ah, okay. Um, so it was also through glass. Oh, that's in London, serious, that's <laughs> why. Um, <laughs> Um, and it was very noisy. I was shooting probably about 1600 ISO, mm -hmm. which is awful on the D200. Then this one was the 50 on my D300. All right, Trafalgar Square? Yes, back when, and that really ages it because most of you who have been to London or know anything about London will know that the fourth plinth always changes. Um, this was the... Um, Most of you who have been in London this year. Yeah, well, not not this year, but in the past. Last year. <laughs> we had the... I don't know what the fourth plinth does now. I haven't... 
they haven't found no, out. No, they actually closed Trafalgar Square for New Year. They barricaded it. Did they? Yeah, so, so, so just not to allow any gatherings. Yeah. Oh, goodness. So this was back in 2009, I think, or 10. 2000 with a beard? Yeah, that was when you could actually... Um, Remember do, those Look at all those days. people! <laughs> wow. So, um, and no masks. No masks. This was also 2009. Um, so this was again on the D300 and it was kind of, I was just kind of pretending to be a tourist really more than anything. With my was 50. it your first time in London? No, it wasn't. And then again, this was with the 50. This is just a night shot. Which um, station is it? This is Olympia. Oh, right. That's around Kensington. my old, okay. my old home, hometown. Um, so... I used the 50 for a number of different things and pretty much everything. As you can see, you used it for studio yeah. and portraiture. I used it for like everything else. Mm -hmm. Beautiful clouds there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that was, you know, D200, D300. So obviously I was using it quite tightly as a as a 75 mil, essentially. Um, so I'm just, wow, all these comments just came in. 35 on a crop frame is a little more than 50. Yes, it's about 52 millimeter, in fact, and is probably quite nice. This is why the DX35 1.8G is a 35, because it's actually a 50, basically. Yeah. On the DX yeah. cameras. Is, is and it costs about the same. Yeah, exactly. So when you buy any um, DX DSLR, you have two options, either 35G or 518G. And generally, we would sell 35 as a standard lens. Yeah. But for people in support, which we would sell 50 because it's equivalent of about 75, yeah. which is 85 mil, roughly. Yeah. And then when I um, finally got used to sort of shooting with a prime lens, I went for the 35 DX so that I would have 50 on my DX cameras. Mm. And um, Jamie, Jamie Tilly points out a random fellow photographer suggested I get a nifty 50 years ago. I wish I knew who they were so I could thank them. My photography evolved in a big way with the 51.8D, which is interesting. I definitely shot differently with a with a prime over a zoom because i also mm. had the all in what like the 18 to 200 and it makes you think differently yeah. uh, with zooms we get spoiled in a way mm -hmm. uh, it, it makes sense if you're a professional photographer because you're there to deliver the result but let's say as a keen enthusiast or hobbyist or takes photography seriously it's i i think having a prime lens makes you think completely differently you have to pre-visualize the shot effectively before taking it yes exactly which is a nice way to do that so you're not just spray and pray yeah you you're not see the shot. zooming in and out. And yeah, you don't you. do this, but you, <laughs> in your mind, you kind of see the shot before you take it. You could do that, but it would be a bit strange. Now, yeah. <laughs> we will do something, probably a little video or something, on all the different 50 mils, because um, I think that it would be of interest. Sounds like a fun video, isn't it? It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> we'll talk about all those different ones. Thank you to Stephen for your contribution. Thank you, Stephen. Con contribution. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a bit Swedish That's there a for a moment. Very good English. That's yeah. right. Um, so uh, thank you for your contribution to the coffee fund. And look, we we got had 123 likes of 228 concurrent viewers. So there's still 105 of we you get in there. that ha don't haven't loved us yet. <laughs> now we have to kind of quite rapidly go through these next focal lengths because we spent so long talking no, about the wide the angle lens. The next length. hour we're going to spend on H5 1.4 <laughs> lens. No, no, you missed one. So you got 50. And then you've got the 60 mil AFD 60, macro. 60 micro. Okay, yeah. Okay. I, I thought you were going to say 8518. I say ignore 8518. There's 1. 1.4 and it's a beast. No, but... there's a reason that I want to talk about this one and it's only for this photo. <laughs> so this, I mm -hmm. used the 60, I had the 62.8D mm -hmm. long before I had the AFSG version. I've got billions of macro mm -hmm. photos taken with it. I really like it. It was very clunky, but I just... I, I had a 60D at uni with my D200, and it was amazing. Wow, that's and that's an 80. Yeah, that was my perfect mil. lens at the time. Oh, wow, that's a 90 <laughs> yeah. mil, yeah. So um, the D had to be nodded to there in that focal length, because 60 is quite an unusual one. Yeah. A lot of people don't, don't think about and it. Very, very loud. Incredibly loud, absolutely. Especially when you start to focus closely, the, the front element would extend so much, about three or four centimeters. <laughs> it would just go, rrr, rrr, yeah. keep going, and you think, when's it going to stop? Um, so just a little nod to the 60 mil there. Um, then we go to the 85. Yes, so they had 85 1.8, mm -hmm. which, which you is, didn't like. Which is not very good compared to 1.4. Now, if you can't afford 1.4, then 1.8 is, um, okay. I would say it's serviceable. 1.8 G is much better, um, especially in terms of sharpness. But now... The H5 1.4D is one of my favorite lens. Mm -hmm. um, it's super sharp, stopped down by about two stops. Yeah. So it's about 2.8. It's amazing. Um, now at 1.4, if you get the focusing right, it looks amazing. <laughs> <But> <laughs> you don't. If you don't, 
it basically ruins shots. So I always kind of start to shoot at f2 and then, yeah, they'll maybe stop down even more if, let's say, I've got a couple more, more people in. Yeah. But the um, out of focus area rendering, the bokeh, is beautiful. It's just buttery, creamy. <laughs> Um, you, whatever it's, you know, you need to leave you alone you for a bit while you just like have a little. Um, a no, that was one of my it. first portrait lenses. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I had 1.8 and then I upgraded to this one and I had it for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I only switched to G versions because of the D100. Yes. And yeah. I couldn't afford the G 1.4, so I had to go to 1.8 G. And I also didn't like the rendering. It no. was sharp, but the, the bokeh wasn't as nice and the color reproduction wasn't as nice. And it's very slow to focus, yeah. weirdly. And then the G it's version, came, then when I could upgrade to 1.4G, then I'm just, it, it, well, it's, it's in my bag. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of color rendering and bokeh, this is almost as good as G version. So I, I would highly recommend on the budget to get this one. So you like it then? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. Now, um, Tadius said uh, the 60mm micro is the Swiss Army knife equivalent for lenses. Great stuff. That's true. I like it. Uh, I agree with that. I think that's... Um, and then someone else asked me something else. Oh, Terry said, you get some exercise moving backwards and forwards to compose with a 50 mil. Yep. Um, this could count towards half an hour of exercise time. Or is it an hour that we're allowed now? I don't know. But anyway, mm. whatever it is, you could use that moving back and forward. <laughs> it certainly makes you think differently as a photographer to use prime. Um... The, and you're quite right, David, uh, or Dixon, actually, it is the 60 mil all macro lenses thus far that I know do not open up fully if you're using the closest focusing distance. That yeah. is just the nature of the beast. Be yeah, because your depth of field is so shallow yeah. that it has to be stopped down. Yeah. Exactly. Now, for things like, let's say, insects, 105, which mm. we'll probably talk about later, we'll is about uh, more recommended. But for studio still life photography, product photography watches jewelry things like this 60 mil is a fantastic choice yeah and it doubles up great as a portrait lens absolutely day. I think absolutely especially on the dx body it's yeah. a 90 mil yeah exactly so now um so we went 60 85 which yes. you fully i got some some love. pictures there as well oh do you um, okay i better show those let me find some them studio work at is it this one yeah it's just kind of series of shots taken, okay so. we're probably going to be in the way a little bit let me move us oh it's I fine it, oh, it's there we go. kind of just gives a good idea i think the only last one on the right is with 50 but the rest is with 80 yeah. There you go. You kind of get the idea there of what um lovely, lovely shots that you and so these are all with the 85 1.4 1. G. Yeah, except the stingent ones. These ones. Yeah, those are on 50. Okay. There we go. So that's that's some examples for you of of those. Now the next sort of bracket, and this is where Simon really kind of pitched in, he said the 105. He was a big fan of the 105s. Mm. 105 2.8D macro. Mm -hmm. They did a non-D version of that as well, um, but not an early version. Mm -hmm. It was the new style. Um, and the 105 DC, DC. Uh, which was, I mean, kind of based off the 105 2.5 AIS, you know, that yes. legendary portrait lens, which I gush about frequently. Um it was, it's a lot larger though. It's much bigger. You've got yeah. one on your desk there. Yes. Ah, I thought it was 135, which looks no, identical yeah, to this. Yeah, the 135 this is slightly 105. bigger still. Now, this one has D, what's called DC stands for defocus control. Yeah. Um, you've got two options there. Well, you, you have a standard option, which would be like all pro, um, normal lenses would give you. Which is what Simon says is is the best use for it. Not as a DC lens, exactly. but as a normal portrait lens. As a DC lens, you've got foreground and rear ground option where it will... Um, blur the area a little bit more compared yeah. to the standard lens, either for foreground area, so for closer to the camera area, or to the rear ground area, which is at the back. Yeah. So, uh, but at the expense of actually sharpness of it the is, image. Yeah, it is a little bit, what era would you say that is? It's a bit it's sort of late 80s, early 90s. Oh, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's the era of the soft focus filters. Soft focus filter effect. And you can you can use it, but you have to match the setting on the lens, yes. the aperture setting on the lens of the defocus control yeah. to the aperture of the camera that you're shooting with. Yeah. So, so what that means, if you're shooting at f4, you either have to set the, the ring to rear 4 or foreground 4. Yeah, or turn it off altogether yeah. and just use it as a normal lens, as Simon suggests. Yeah. So Simon said, he sent me this lovely email um, this morning, he said the Macro 105 I'm not going to read this until I'm going backwards, but anyway, the Macro 105 is another amazingly sharp lens, very well corrected. B 
The uh, 105F2 is a highly useful optic. I had one for a long time, hardly ever used the DC function, but at F2, it was great for close quarter portraits. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, if you want 105 as your focal length, and obviously now we've got the 105 1 1.4, which again is another lens that I love. Um, yes and would probably just have the 28 and the 105. Those are the sharpest Nikon lenses yeah. ever. At the, at, I would say that they are. So if I could have just two lenses, it would be those, not because they're focal lengths I use, yeah. <laughs> just because they're so nice. Um, so that's the 105s. And then we have the 135 mm -hmm. DC, which was exactly the same kind of concept as the 105, but a 135 focal length. This is one that Nikon have um, many times I've asked them if they're going to do an update. I would yes. love them to do a one three. Th that's my personal wish list. Yeah, you know, it's the first on the list. Um, if you have H five, then one o five DC wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. So the one three five would be the next one up because then you can use one three five for portrait, let's say outdoors when you have plenty of space. Yeah. And H five in close quarters. Yeah. And there was one point where um, I remember there were loads and loads of articles and blog posts and things saying that the 135 was at the time the sharpest prime. Um, obviously on newer cameras, as our sensors became higher resolution, you start getting kind of optical issues where they would back focus or front focus and um, it would be very tiring to, <laughs> to kind of sort out. Um, but the 135 definitely deserves an acknowledgement, even though I didn't bring one up from downstairs. Mm. So. <laughs> It, it looks like this, yes. just about one centimeter taller. <laughs> exactly. Then we jump from 135 to one that so many people mentioned, which was the 180 mm f 2.8. Mm -hmm. That was another one that I had for a while that I used for concerts mm -hmm. before I had the 70 to 200. Um, because it was smaller and lighter. Smaller and lighter, exactly. Um, and the 180, so many people were mentioning throughout the stream that they loved the 180 mm 2.8. It's another one that would be interesting if they could do a small prime, mm. you know, because then you jump to the 200 F2 and it it's like a Well, cannon. as we always say, Becky, they release 120 to 300, which is huge like this, but it replaces <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I know. Which is not a replacement. I know. It's a silly answer from Nikon, really. We, it is. We do I don't think want... it was an official statement. It was yeah. kind of like a... Well, we're not going to replace these lenses because yeah. we've got this one now. Yeah, if you're sports and wildlife photography, it makes sense. But if you're a portrait photographer, buying 120 to 300 doesn't make sense. It's no. just too too big. It's too bulky. Yeah. But just the same as the 200 f2 doesn't make sense as a portrait lens because yeah. it's massive. But is probably yeah. a perfect. I would love to have one portrait lens. Um, David mentions the 58 1.4G. Yes, it is a beautiful lens. I mean, if I. If I was going to own three lenses, it would be 28, 58, and 105, all of the 1.4s. Yeah, good setup. Um, great setup. Wow. And insurance would be quite expensive. But and not 35, 1.4. <laughs> well, this is the, because the 28, 1.4 would kind of replace out the 35 for me. I've got True. a 35, 1.4. That's my. That's but my 35, main 1.4 has its special rendering. Though. It does. It does. And I, I do like it. That is the lens that I use yeah. like most of the time. Um, right. I have missed a couple of comments so there was something to do with contrast and micro lenses so sorry if i if i missed that um yeah speaking of contrast i actually do find that g lenses especially zooms mm -hmm. produce more contrast than the d lenses interesting and for studio work and for people i prefer more neutral rendering than more contrasty rendering personally yeah yeah exactly and i mean there's a reason why we eventually updated but i still i mean there's a reason why i also keep a little arsenal of manual focus lenses mm. even though uh, i'm using digital most of the time or at least half of the True. time so i've got manual focus lenses for film it would be nice to have d lenses across the range but there's a few gems that mm. they didn't turn into and the good thing is they're quite small so they don't take yeah. too much space they don't but like the 200 f4 ais they didn't make an, an oh four version. years yes 105 2.5 is so much smaller than the 105 mm -hmm. dc um 55 macro 55 1.2 oh yeah you've got them all basically 28 yeah, fine. Yeah. <laughs> 28 3.5 which is like this big anyway yeah so there's a reason reason just for... a small amount of lenses small, which small... becky doesn't i use. have a small lens cupboard <laughs> <laughs> um okay so dominic just to um answer your question any dutch delivery news please we were going to put it on the podcast but just as a quick update the, sorry the, the dutch delivery news this is oh yes um yeah yes. The, the shipment has been released from it holding and is slowly making its way yeah to it's, a, it's a horse carriage yeah um that doesn't necessarily mean that 
everyone's everyone's orders will ship out at the end of next week because it depends on what comes in it but it's a lot of stuff so hopefully if you're waiting for something it might be in there um but that is progress uh right so last but not least the 200 f4 d is the last lens that we need to talk about the micro the micro this was one that simon said um it's outstanding and he couldn't believe that nikon haven't updated it but fingers crossed they'll eventually yeah, be they've Z discontinued it when about a year ago two years now uh not even it was a year about yeah. a year and then the second hand one should showed up in price and Massive. now they're going for more than there was a price brand new for that lens yeah yeah and um i mean it's an odd one because as simon pointed out it's a shame you can't use these afd lenses with the focus shift shooting mode because it'd be super mm -hmm. useful with a lens like that but if you um if you need a macro lens for those long distance mainly i'd say like insects and butterflies yes. and stuff then the 200 yeah is you need that distance isn't it because yeah. otherwise you're too close you may spook them exactly and during again during lockdown i did a lot with the 200 mil no with the 70 to 180 actually afd lens but that's a zoom so we can't mm -hmm. talk about that that book that we've got <laughs> yes was it shot on 200 i four? thought it was shot on the 105 okay anyway okay. we'll Talk about that later. Uh, next week, <laughs> not later, because we're going to run out of time. Wink, wink. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So that pretty much covers. Yes, we're not going to go to 300 or 400 Ds. Um... I mean, you know, those long, long telephoto primes, they were massive. We were kind yeah. of going for the shorter end. We were too young and too to poor to have experience <laughs> to with them. ever own those. I have no experience with those. Um, and also, they weighed an absolute ton. Yes, they did. For sure. Um, but we will do our giveaway drawing now yes while the before my 5g completely runs out my phone is nuclear yeah and while becky's doing it please give us a thumbs up if you like the stream or thumbs down yeah if you don't don't give us a thumbs down i don't want a thumbs down. <laughs> well it's going to be personally for me isn't it so it's you know it's never you know, um, i don't get the compliments uh Nick, we're not going to do the Zooms this week. We no. will, we're just doing primes. Even then, we didn't have enough time to do them all. Yeah, so. otherwise we would be here for another hour. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, I'm drawing the thing. Yes. Have I finished yet? All right, is the winner is... And the winner is... It's Simon Platt. Yay! Well done, Simon. Well done, Simon. You have won... As a regular viewer, well done also. It's nice to have um, have you have won something. You have won this remarkable using it as a lens Yeah, not a microphone. Not the... Not a microphone. That's mine. This one. But a Nick and a Celebration book by Brian Long. Congratulations. Yes. Very, very big congratulations to you. So send us an email over to media at grayswestminster.co.uk and we will get that sent out to you. Uh, right. There we go. That was today's stream. Whew. Fantastic. <laughs> thank like you very to, much, everyone. We'd like to thank everybody who has subscribed while we've been while we've been streaming, who has given us a thumbs up. That is yeah. very much appreciated. Yeah. Who has contributed yeah. to the coffee fund? Are you going to go and get the coffees? Yes, okay. definitely. Thank and you. we have a plan. <laughs> we want to reach six thousand subscribers yes. by mid February. Yes, please. So if you can contribute, we do appreciate that. Yeah. So fifty one percent that are watching that haven't subscribed, please do subscribe. We'll be there. We would be there in no time at all, and it would be great. We will do a fantastic little celebration. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a little dance yeah. just just for you on video. <laughs> Becky, I can't dance. <laughs> that's, that's the whole point. I'm the guy who stands with bottle of beer on the, in the dance club. But, <laughs> on yeah. the side, yeah. I take a bit of encouragement, but then I eventually get there. Right. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Have a wonderful week and weekend, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. So much. Bye.